So welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to have a relatively lengthy conversation about building your first DIY system. We're going to go over some of the pros and cons of all the different components that you can do in a DIY solar system. We're going to talk about portable power stations, compare the two, because that gets compared on the channel a lot. So the whole reason I've decided to build me a DIY system is we have a couple more structures coming on the property and I want to convert them all to solar, including one structure that we already have. So I set out to build myself a system. I'm all the time reviewing portable power stations and I get comments all the time. Hey, you could build your own system for a lot less money. And that's very true, although there's some comparisons that we should make. So if you're interested in building your first ever DIY system, we're going to go through and explain all the components, what you need to shop for, where you need to spend your money, what's going to make the most sense for you. And at the end of this video, we're going to do a couple of days of testing. We're actually going to charge up my DIY system here, and we're going to try to run some household appliances and other things that you may be interested in. So I've tried to build a system that's somewhat comparable to some portable power stations that I've already done on the channel. Now, wattage is going to be a little different. Battery capacity is going to be slightly different, but they're within the same range. And my ultimate goal was to try to build something for about half the price of a common name brand portable power station. So for starters, why do you want to build a DIY system? Some people just want to learn and they just like educating themselves. I do. A lot of people, it's about money because you can again build a DIY system for a lot less money than a portable power station. Now don't let me down portable power stations. They're compact, they're convenient. A lot of them have nicer and more efficient charge controllers. Usually they can handle even more solar, but you can build all that out in your own system as well. So they do have their advantages as well. Not to mention it's just a nice compact clean package that you could stick in a shop somewhere in the closet and pull it out when an emergency arises. The typical person that's gonna do a DIY system is probably gonna put it out in a shop, a small cabin, and you can kind of upgrade it as you go, but it's going to be more of a permanent system instead of something that you can just pick up and travel with. So let's talk about my system right here. First and foremost, I bought a 24 volt, 1500 watt continuous, 3000 peak sine wave inverter. Now let's start with the inverters. You can get all different sizes out there, so you need to pay attention to that. Plus you need to pick a proper size inverter for the size battery you're running. You can do 12 volt, 24 volt, now they make 36 volt batteries, 48 all the way up to 72 depending on how big you're going to build your system and depending on how you're going to parallel or series batteries in I've got videos on the channel covering that especially with solar panels you can raise and lower the voltage of batteries as well but you need to make for sure whatever your final voltage of your battery or battery set is going to be that your inverter is compatible with it now as far as the output wattage 1500 watts in my example I was building this for an upcoming room that I know that I'm probably going to use less than half that amount of power and you always want to go a little bigger so you have a buffer. It's better to spend the money up front than, well, have to change your inverter out down the road. So 1500 watts, what would that run in a typical household or shop? Well, that would easily run a freezer and refrigerator as long as you don't start them both up at the same time because there's initial surges to compressors, for example. That would easily run window units medical equipment such as CPAPs, fans, charger phones, run TVs, stuff like that. And you can run a combination of all that. 1500 watts is a good amount of power. Plus that 3000 watt surge can really handle the buffer of say compressor starting up on a window AC, that freezer, that refrigerator, things such as that. That's what majority of people are gonna build a DIY system for. Now I've had a lot of you also talk about building DIY systems for your ham radio, emergency preparedness, things such as that. And really this would already be an overkill for that type of system. Sine wave inverter. That's what you want. That is good clean power, just like what's coming from the grid. And a lot of your medical equipment, sensitive electronics, laptops, things such as that, they're going to want to see good clean power. You're going to be tempted if you're shopping for inverters to want to get a modified sine wave or an old school square wave inverter. That's very very dirty power and not necessarily what your electronics are going to want to see. Go ahead and spend the money on a sine wave inverter. Typically they're about twice the price of your standard inverter. Next let's talk about charge controllers. I have a 20 amp charge controller from Bouge RV right here. They're extremely affordable. By the way, I think I paid about $150 for this 24 volt inverter right here this solar charge controller to charge my battery and to bring the solar input in and convert it for you was $30. Now there's going to be two different types of solar charge controllers that you're going to hear about. 
MPPT, which is your more advanced, just think of it as a smart solar charge controller, They're typically a lot more efficient on the conversion of bringing in the power from the solar panels and converting it over to your stored battery power. And then you have what's called a PWM charge controller, uh, which is the most basic of all and the least efficient. But again, you're talking $30 versus about $100 to $130. So there's a pretty big jump up between the two charge controllers there. But again, if you're trying to build a very efficient system, a smart system, go ahead and spend the extra money on the MPPT solar charge controllers. You're also going to notice there's lots of different amperage ratings out there. The most common I'm seeing for your smaller DIY systems is your 10 amp solar charge controllers, 20 amp and 30 amp. Keep in mind the amperage of that solar charge controller is going to determine the amperage that you can bring in from your solar panels as well as the charge output going to your battery. This large 24 volt battery, for example, recommends a kind of a standard charge amperage of 20 amps, but you can go up to 50. If you're going to have heavy use in your particular instance or a lot of extra batteries, you're going to want to up your solar charge controller to handle that additional load and pull off of your system. If you're also planning on adding more solar panels, well, you're going to want a larger solar charge controller to handle that. That. This one, for example, is smart enough that it can handle 12 volt or 24 volt batteries. I'm running a really large 24 volt right here. It can handle up to 55 volts from my solar panels. That sticker rating will be on the back of yours or when you're shopping around. And it's rated for up to 20 amps of solar charge input. So the reason all that's important, again, you're sizing your system properly. You don't want to have a heavy pull in a system here with only just a couple of panels out there trying to charge it back up. If you're continuously using five or six hundred watts for example and going to use that around the clock while you're trying to get out of an emergency situation or whatever you've built the system for you're going to want to upsize your solar charge controller to handle more than that power that's going out so you can continue to add back to your system so my recommendation get the largest solar charge controller you can afford and try to upgrade to the MPPT now if you're building a very basic system for a small structure like I'm going to do and I was trying to keep this at about half the price of that portable power power station, well, I opted for the cheaper solar charge controller. So next, and what we need to spend some time talking about is batteries. My, how I've learned so much about batteries over the last few months as I've ventured into solar. We're actually running this shop right here off grid on solar and we're converting most of the property over. So small DIY systems to really large, true off-grid systems for a 1500 square foot shop, for example. Now, full disclosure, I purchased all the equipment and connectors uh, to make my DIY system, but I did have Enjoybot reach out to me a while back and ask me if I would like to try one of their larger lithium batteries. I said, sure, I'm not getting paid. However, if you use the link down in the description for any of their batteries, if you purchase using one of those links, I do earn a small commission. That's how I earn income to make a lot of these videos. Now, with that said, if we have any issues with the battery, we're gonna be open and honest about that because you, the viewer, are truly what supports me doing this, not these companies. So what they sent me out was their 24 volt, 100 amp hour battery. Now this battery is rated at 25.6 volts. You're typically gonna see your lithium batteries run at a higher voltage. 12 volt, for example, is typically in the 13 plus voltage range. So 24 volts or 25.6 times 100 amp hours, this is how you get your watt hours. That's 2,560 watt hours. That large portable power station I had over here, for example, was only 2,000 watt hours. So this has an additional 500 watt hours but we're running about 500 watts less on inverter output. But that's the beauty of a DIY system. You can manipulate and change any of this all that you want to get more power, more battery storage, change all these pieces to fit your budget. Now I wanna have a decent conversation about batteries because there is a big misconception out there. I was always of the old school lead acid batteries. That's what I've known my whole life. They just work, you buy them, you throw them out every four or five years and you get you another one. But there's so much more to batteries. Now, if you wanted to build this system on the absolute dirt cheap, you'd go out and get you say $150 deep cycle lead acid battery, $150 inverter, 30 amp charge controller and worth 330 bucks for a very powerful system. The problem is that battery is not gonna run as long as you think and it has nowhere near the capacity of a system like this. So let's talk about the advantages of lithium versus lead. We'll go ahead and start. I got my little chart over here. The only thing that I personally feel like lead excels in is well, just price, price alone. Now lithium, for example, there's a lot of misconceptions here and a lot of stuff people don't know about them. Let's discuss some of the benefits of lithium. First and foremost, 
they weigh about half the amount of lead. So if you're moving this system around or just handling a big battery like this, this one's actually quite light. I mean, I can lift it up easy to be a large 24 volt battery. As I stated earlier, typically these batteries run at a higher voltage. I'm now running lithium batteries on my fishing boat for my trolling motor and I can tell a difference running all day long because my 12 volt batteries out there stay in the 13 volt range all day long. They don't discharge and drop like lead acid batteries do. So on motorized pieces of equipment like that, typically you're gonna get longer running and stronger running out of your equipment. A lot of people have misconceptions that lithium iron phosphate batteries can't handle cold or heat, but a lot of the newer ones now are smart. This EnjoyBot, for example, has a battery management system in. That's something pretty standard nowadays with these lithium batteries. So on the inside of this battery, not only does it monitor discharge current, low and high, it monitors temperature. So if you get too low of a temperature for charging, which is around 32 degrees for lithium, it automatically cuts that off. However, discharge temperature, I believe on this particular model, runs down to like minus four degrees. So you can continue to use that. And if you're in an area where you're gonna have extremely cold temperatures and that concerns you, they even offer batteries that have built-in warmers on them. The other very important thing that you need to know about lithium batteries is what's called depth of discharge or DOD. So lead acid battery, for example, typically you can only discharge down to about 50% before you'll physically damage the battery. So you're only getting 50% of the battery. Not to mention, typically it comes off the charger at around 12.5, 12.6 volts, and it immediately starts dropping into the 11 volt range. So you're not getting a whole lot of capacity out of that battery. And again, you wanna stop. You don't wanna go any lower. You start getting in the tens to a completely dead battery, the 10 volt range, well, you physically damage that battery for life. Whereas lithium batteries can truly be discharged up to 100%. So you're talking about getting potentially twice the amount of runtime out of these. Now, most manufacturers are gonna recommend that you do 80% depth of discharge, leaving 20% remaining capacity on these batteries. For example, if you read the top here, how they rate this battery, you can get 2,000 recharge cycles on this battery if you completely discharge it. 100% depth of discharge every time. If you'll do 80% depth of discharge, they claim 5,000 recharge cycles on this. That is a tremendous amount of recharging. Most people will never ever come close to that. So let's roll right into life of battery. This is where I'm sold on lithium versus lead. Most people look at lithium batteries and they typically run about twice the cost of a lead battery and people are thinking they're twice as expensive. Well, that's just not the case. Your average lithium battery has about a 10 year warranty on it. This one does right here. I think they have full parts and replacement on this up to three years if I remember correctly. And they have a certain money day back guarantee. I'd have to look back through the manual. And then they also prorate or cover this up to 10 years. So your average lead battery is gonna get you around four to five years is what I typically always get out of them. You'll have a rare case or one will last a little longer. And if you can get 10 years out of these, this lasts twice as long. So is it really twice the cost? No, not at all. Actually, they're about the same cost, but it gets even better than that. Remember the depth of discharge, you're actually getting more runtime and more use out of a lithium battery. Really, if you factor all that in, if my mind is thinking correctly, they're cheaper in the long run. I can tell you I'm sold on lithium batteries, using them in my boat, seeing how high voltage they maintain, how long they run, how much you can discharge them, running my entire shop with huge lithium batteries right now, I think it's absolutely the way to go over the old heavy lead acid batteries that are being phased out. Now with that said, there's some things we need to factor in. If we only wanna discharge our battery to 80%, so you take 80% of that 2,560 watt hours or whatever size battery that you have, because you wanna to try to protect it and get the most life out of it, but you can go down to 0% if you need to. Then there's something called conversion losses. Depending on the type of inverter that you have, there's always gonna be conversion losses. Nothing's for free in life. So when you have your solar panel, say bringing in 600 watts through this, you're gonna have conversion losses going through a solar charge controller to convert it over to, well, your proper voltage and DC charging for your battery. So then whenever you pull that stored power out of a battery source like this, which is DC, process it through an inverter to AC, there's some conversion losses there. Typically in the industry, in the 80% range is kind of what you're gonna see a lot of your cheaper equipment at. Your higher quality equipment's gonna be in the 90 plus range. So you have some losses to factor in there. So don't look at your battery 
overall capacity and think that's how much I'm getting and I'm covered. You always want to have a buffer right there. So if you look right here on the side of my 1500 watt inverter, by the way, I'll list all this in the description if you're interested. I picked all this up on Amazon. You have a positive and a negative battery terminal that comes off and runs well to the positive and negative on this. Don't forget 24 volt battery buy you a 24 volt rated inverter and you can see they make inverters all the way up to 110 volts. And then it's very simple on this output side. You have your power on. You're going to see this ramp itself up to 120 volts. Then you have a couple of your standard receptacles. You could plug stuff directly into this or we could even make a pigtail to come off of this, wire into a box and actually wire like say a small shopping structure up. Now over here on this Bouge RV 20 amp charge controller that I have, this one is actually set up to handle 12 or 24 volts. I went through the menu and programmed that. You can see we have different battery types. This will handle like seven different battery types, including lithium iron phosphate. There's a little battery symbol right here, positive negative for battery. And we're going to hook up some solar panels whenever it gets done raining. And we can input positive negative off our solar panels here. And then it'll do the conversion and charging of the battery for us. You run those wires right back down. And that's it. I mean, this system is so simple. You can set up some permanent solar panels to hook to this, or you can just go slap up a couple portable ones out in the yard and kind of make you somewhat of a portable system right here. So people often ask me why I have 100 watt solar panels. By the way, if you're new to the channel, this is my current solar array. 24 100 watt panels. We're eventually going to add on to this. But the reason I went 100 watt panels, they're small, they're compact, and they're easy to replace. Should I have hail damage or any kind of damage, cheaper to replace. And because I do testing and reviews on the channel, so I can go anywhere from 100 watts, 200 watts, all the way to 2400 watts. I can make any kind of combination I want to test all these types of things. So if you look on the back side of these panels, they're rated at 24.3 volts. Remember, my charger says I can't go over 55 volts. So that means I could series two of these together for 48 volts and still be under the 55. These are also five amp panels. I have a 20 amp charger. It says not to exceed 20 amps. So we could parallel some of these panels and you know, get up to 15. I'm not gonna push it to 20 amps being that this could potentially go over that cause it's 5.2. Put four of them together, we'd be over 20 amps. So I'm gonna disconnect these six and I'm gonna mess with these over here. So if you're not familiar what series and parallel is, we'll go over it really quick and then we'll dive back in. Again, I have videos explaining this in more detail. You can see these are a positive and negative coming out of a single panel. I have the positive coming off of one panel, hooking up to the negative on another panel. That's called seriesing, whenever you hook a positive and negative together. What that does is that increases your voltage. It doubles it, so we'd be running 48 volts doing that. When you take a positive, and hook to a positive. You take a negative and hook to a negative on another panel, that's called paralleling. Your voltage stays the same, but your amperage, that five amps would double to 10 amps. And in order to do that, you'll need some little Y adapters just like this in order to do some combining. So you can pick these up really cheap on Amazon. So let me show you what all we did here. I've got four panels I'm gonna play with right here for this setup. We hooked a positive and a negative from two separate panels together. So remember that's called seriesing. So our voltage went up to 48 volts because these are 24 volt panels. I did the same thing over here, a positive to a negative, and that brought me up to 48 volts. So I'm left with now a positive and negative dangling off of each of the two sets because two are hooked together, two are hanging in the middle of the air. So I took the negative from one set, the negative from another, put them on a combiner, and we're running that into the shop. Positive from one set, positive from another, combining it run to the shop. So what that essentially is doing is taking two 48 volt sets, because we series them, now we're paralleling them with the what's left hanging. That increases our amperage up to 10 amp, because these are five amp panels. Parallel increases amperage, series increases voltage. So now we have 48 volts going into the shop, at 10 amps. All right, I have some jumper wires hooked up to the solar input side of my charge controller here, and I have my wires coming in from outside. We're gonna quickly verify that we're under that 55 volt maximum right here because we do not want to burn up our charge controller. So all I gotta do is take my multimeter, and we're showing 45 volts, perfect. 
Now that voltage is gonna swing a little because it's a cloudy day out there. We've got rain coming in and out. That's just gonna happen. So let's plug both of these in and see what happens. So we're showing 4.2 amps. That's gonna swing around as the uh, sun comes out as well. You can see solar is showing lit up now with a little symbol at the top left of the solar panels and there's an arrow going over to the battery showing that we are now charging to the battery itself. Never mind my flip-flops, I've been outside working in the pool. But it is late afternoon, it's time to run a test. We're gonna see if we can run a full-size freezer and refrigerator all night long off of this system. This is a test I run all the time with solar equipment. The reason being, this is the most common appliances people are trying to protect and run off-grid and run in emergency situations. All right, so I've got a splitter up here. I'm gonna run my freezer and refrigerator to this extension cord right here. You go ahead and plug this in, flip this on. All right, you see my refrigerator is now lit up. Wait a few seconds and I'm gonna plug in the freezer. No trips, no problem. I didn't hear the compressors kick on. So keep in mind, now they're technically sitting at zero watts while they're not running. That's the beauty of appliances like this. When they kick on a run, they're pulling power. Other than that, they're sitting there idle because everything has been cooled down on the inside and there's no need to run. All right, we're gonna let this run all night long and check the voltage in the morning and kind of see how much battery capacity that we have. If my math's correct and if this inverter is somewhat efficient, we should make it all the way through the night before we need to charge this back up again first thing in the morning. All right, so here we are the next morning, almost 12 hours later, and I was in here getting the camera ready. This is the first time I've ever heard the fans kick on on this, but I guess running 12 plus hours, it's due to have a cool off period. I can also hear the compressor running on the refrigerator. So we do have a small load on it. Okay, so the fan only ran for a few seconds, and the good news is we're still showing 25.9 volts. We started out this test at 26.9, just a little under full capacity on the battery. And according to my online chart, you don't consider this battery fully dead till 24 volts, the lower end around 20% battery capacity remaining is uh, about 25 volts. So we still have a ways to go. This battery is actually doing extremely well on capacity. I've run this test recently with another device, but it had 500 watt hours less of capacity. And it was almost dead at this point. Guess my dog's gonna check it out. So I'm happy with what I'm seeing. Let's check for heat or any issues. That's relatively cool. Everything feels great. I'm gonna let this run a little while longer. Looks like uh, we can get quite a bit more runtime out of this. All right, so you wanna see something impressive? I've just come back out here. Look, the battery voltage is back up. You can see we don't have any solar inputs going to the charge controller, so I'm not charging. And the voltage is back. That's because right now neither freezer or refrigerator are running. So the battery has settled back out. It just drops when it's under load. That makes sense. The impressive thing, y'all, 26.3 volts resting. So if I look at my little handy dandy lithium battery chart right here, hopefully it'll focus. 26.4 volts is 70%, 26.1 is 60%. So this battery is rested somewhere in that 65% range. When under load, you've seen we were down around 25.6, I think it was, which is showing 20%. So I'm gonna go with that number just to be safe, but at rest, it's showing we still have a lot of capacity left. All right, so let's wrap this video up. That was a good initial test of this system. Again, I built this because it's gonna run a structure on my property that's not gonna be anywhere near as demanding as the freezer and refrigerator was, especially running all night long. So you always wanna overbuild your system and have extra capacity. That way, if you have cloudy days or you have a day where you heavily use, you're always covered and available. This is way larger than what I'm gonna need for what it's built for. But again, I'm covered in case I have multiple days where I can't charge it. And no matter what type of system you build, whether it's a huge off-grid system with a bunch of 48 volt batteries, or it's one of their smaller 12 volt, 100 amp power batteries, and you're gonna start out with a more entry level system for just a few hundred bucks, I highly recommend you go with lithium, no matter what type of system you built. So thanks to Joybot for sending out the battery. Thank you for watching and supporting the channel. We truly do appreciate it. And you're gonna see this system getting installed and used here in the near future. We'll catch you on the next video.